of, of what's gone on in the last seven or eight years at this stage in terms of um, the, the banking system not being available to support uh, construction. Uh, one of our recommendations in that regard, uh, and we've said this on a number of occasions, would be the provision of a specialist construction finance bank of a type. I know we've heard this before, but we would say that it really needs um, a real consideration in that the, 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 the policy objective or the implementation of that would be to build up a, a strong banking system in that area, a bit like an ACC or an ICC bank, targeting particular um, uh, areas of infrastructure and uh, areas of, of housing construction. So you have expertise in that area who understand the, the risks associated with, with construction and then also who can build up relationships with the appropriate people to support that construction base. At the moment, the majority of construction finance is being delivered by uh, the REITs in terms of their, their building the office schemes. However, beyond that, it's been delivered by um, a variety of uh, private equity houses, and it, it's well documented already, but the, the percentage uh, levels of finance there vary anywhere from 8 to 15 percent, which is just unsustainable. Um, uh, so that we see that as, as, as a big issue. Um, the, the second issue is the availability of, of, of uh, housing land. Um, and uh, there are a variety of um, um, well-reported sales transactions on, for private land, and uh, I suppose we differentiate that between uh, what's a, a crisis in terms of delivery of, of, of housing that where there's a need, and then there where there's people to want where does a want uh, or a desire, should I say, as in um, it is well and good for someone to go and bid on, on sites and, and pay whatever price they think they can at open market value, and if they go then and transact that for people who have the capacity to buy that house, well, that's the private uh, market in, 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 in action, and th that maybe should go its own way. Uh, however, if there is a real and there is a real uh, housing need, then we're of the view that that should be supported in a much more vigorous way, and that should be supported. Uh, uh, one of the options available there is through the housing associations, who have been filling a gap in the last five to six years and going back even further, back a hundred years when they were set up originally. They've advanced over time and they offer a real specialist service there. And from our knowledge and my own personal professional knowledge of dealing with some of those larger entities, they have the capacity there. That would lead on then, in, in, uh, in, in our view, to possibly freeing up the local authorities to do much more of the planning side and the long-term strategic side in terms of the um, advancement of planning uh, on the basis of strategic development zones. Now, not all of these strategic development zones work that well. However, some that have worked have worked quite well. We picked the Docklands in Dublin, although you don't necessarily have residential housing happening there at the moment. A number of other projects have come to fruition, and that was on the basis of an SCZ. In, in summary, we would say that the planning system needs to be streamlined so that when we do things like SCZs for, throughout Ireland, that that would be the planning process, rather than local area plans, regional plans, uh, and, and then um, um, county plans every every seven or eight years. So that's a real area that could be focused upon. Um, and we'd say that all of those um, uh, could be under the auspices of an entity, um, uh, like a housing minister of a type, where you would have a full-time professional uh, civil service that would support that, that would take those work streams and, and, and apply themselves to it, and that would report back to a central entity. We would take the example of um, uh, and again, uh, it's just familiar to me, so I'll pick it of the Docklands Development Authority in Dublin. Uh, when that was set up originally, that, was, uh, that whole area was derelict. And I think if you brought someone back who, who, who departed this earth in 1990, 1989, and said and dropped them down in the North Keys in Dublin or the South Keys, they wouldn't recognise it, particularly down the Docklands area. They say, how could this have happened? It's, it's just unfathomable. And yet, it was done on the basis of a strategic development plan supported by uh, the Docklands Development Authority. Now, it, we understand the Docklands Development Authority didn't end up, uh, I suppose, long term the way it, it was envisaged, but it did a majority of good work for the years that it was there in the early days. And we need something the equivalent of that, but maybe on a national scale, to deal with this issue. And finally, uh, I suppose as an introductory piece, we would say that we need to be focused not only on the immediate issues here today, but also let, let's not be caught out in terms of a, from a planning point of view, let's look at the long term issues in terms of the demographics that are there at the moment, in terms of the uh, age profile of people in housing, that 
anyone who takes on this role or any entity that takes on this role should have a remit to look long term. And it's very difficult when we do short term planning to deal on a long term basis. And we can go back to quote reports going back 40 years, Buchanan reports and others that had very strategic views that needed support over multiple administrations to make them happen. So in terms of high level issues, we would say what they are. Uh, finally, sorry, and, and not, not to keep talking too much about this, but in terms of the implementation and the cost of housing and where that sits versus private and public, uh, my colleague Nihal has referred to a work that uh, the guys on the quantity surveying side have done, and it's a, it is a real relevant piece of, uh, of work, and I think it would be of real benefit to anyone who, who, who reviews it. But w one of the immediate things there that one would pick it it doesn't matter if it's private or public, but if you wanted to stimulate, would, would be a reduction on VAT in the middle of all that in terms of just granular what needs to be done to try and assist uh, development, a reduction in levies, another granular issue that, issue that might assist in, in development, and um, the finance costs, which I've referred to earlier on. Um, so um, apart from that, I'll, I'll hand it back. Okay. Okay. So, um We'd be delighted to take your questions. Um, just to summarise then on just the heading, so we feel the system is broken. We believe you should have a minister uh, who will look after the whole area of infrastructure, land, construction, um, the financial model uh, and market data and something that's scalable. We need to obviously build for what we need. So the pipeline, no more than any other pipeline, needs to be have a foresight and sustainability. So uh, again, that would come within the, the, the department uh, allocated to, to draw these pieces together. Um, availability of finance, uh, the local authorities uh, bringing together the infrastructure and investment and ahead of time, not, not after the houses are, are half built. Um, reducing uh, the VAT, as uh, my colleagues mentioned, streamlining the plan planning process. And I suppose uh, in the rental sector, just to conclude on that particular piece, whilst there is kind of, a, I suppose, a, a dialogue out there that seems to think, you know, if we go in the direction of rental, it's, it's going to solve all our problems. It's like a lot of things, we feel there has to be balance in that space. A lot of the wealth of this country has been built up uh, as people buy their houses and save for their houses over 20 years. At the, end, at the end, maybe they own their houses, their income stream has come down, and that looks after them in their old age. So if people don't uh, invest in their houses, we're going to have another problem for the state long term. So there has to be balance put into that piece whilst we do look at a sustainable uh, and regulated rental sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, at this stage, colleagues, uh, I will take questions. I'd be conscious that we're resuming early afternoon, so you might keep the questions as direct and as specific as possible. Deputy O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. The first thing I'd have to take issue with is what you said about the Docklands. As somebody who's from a Dockland community and um, still living there and representing it, um, that model is not to be totally recommended because they certainly made an awful lot of mistakes, not least of which was the conflict of interest between the DDDA and, and the banks and their lack of engagement with the existing communities down there. Now, my difficulty with them at the moment through the SDZ is the limited amount of land becoming available for housing and particularly for social housing yet they have the space there and we're back to the 10 percent um, so I just wanted to make, make that point there and um, to get your view could more not be done on housing in terms of the Docklands because the space is there my fear is is that a lot of the housing is going to be for attracting in workers through foreign direct investment rather than the people or people whom we need to house. And the second quest question is then on the hard cost of the building unit. You say less than 50% is on the overall, the actual building. Could you break down the percentages of the other 50%? Thank you. Deputy Butler, I'll take a few of the, these together. We'll come back to you, Deputy Butler. Um, thanks. Here, like, I was just looking there at your proposals to improve supply and sustainability. Um, I wonder, could you expand on two, please? Um, streamline planning process and the alternative social housing delivery model, please. Thank you. Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very quickly, and I, I will only come in once, I hope. Uh, the first item is the, the <laughs> current crisis, a direct consequence of a lack of national strategy. I think it's a consequence of a bad uh, national strategy, which, which uh, change took, took place about 15 years ago, when there was an over-reliance on the private rental sector to deliver everything. And at that particular time, and during the boom, incidentally, Mr. Chairman, this is an important feature, during the boom, uh, the rental prices achieved the same levels as, as, as the mortgage. 
during the boom. So th there's obviously a contradiction there. Quickly, oh, uh, um, the, the, the other item I would mention, the, there was a reliance previously on two sources of income for those borrowing for, for, for uh, personal house purchase. One was the building societies, when there were mutual societies, and the other then the banks came into it afterwards. Only came into it after, relatively afterwards. And we know what happened in that, in that area. There was an over-availability of, of finance, which in turn resulted in a massive increase in house prices, because the banks were competing with each other in order to find out who could give the most money in in, with, with the least uh, uh, difficulty. Next is quality of housing, and just very quickly there, some of the houses deve developed, and particularly local authority ones, during the boom period are not what I would regard as an adequate response to anybody's request or requirement of housing. And the margins will have been referred to already, Chairman. Uh, the margins ranging from 15% up to 60%, and somewhere in the middle of that, there must be some kind of recommendation, uh, an area that we can, that we, that we can um, uh, uh, deal with. And the last point is in relation to policy options for the provision of affordable housing. Uh, some of us have made numerous uh, uh, submissions over the last 10 years or so uh, to the Department of Finance, the Department of the Environment, the Department of Public Expenditure, and prior to that, to the previous ministers uh, in previous administrations. And there seems to be a difficulty when it comes down to that crucial factor, how to provide the funding and the wherewithal in the local authorities to deliver their part of the market. Do their part of the market. Thank you. I just remind if anybody has a phone, you might put them on flight or turn them off. And in this group, uh, Deputy Collins. Yeah, it's similar to the question I put to um, the construction industry and um, the breakdown of that cost of building houses. And I would, I would generally agree with the points you're coming from that there has to be a national strategy, and that has to come from somewhere, and that has to come from some sort of ministry within that. Because I've always argued that. That's saying that property has um, rights, it also has responsibilities, and it always seems to, to fail on that aspect in relation to uh, the private end of things. So um, I'd like you to develop that idea of the national strategy, because um, you'd have to take, obviously, uh, take on board the fact that in some areas land is cheaper than other areas, do you cut the caps on lands, the idea of targeting areas where houses can be built that are need to be built on housing needs. And then the private developers as well coming in on, on the back of that. And you're, you're, you're um, thinking on how much profit should be, margin should be there. Should it be 20%, 10% or whatever? And then also in relation to the, keeping construction costs down over a period of time, that's going to be very difficult, you know, if you're going to have, you know, obviously people looking for extra on selling materials, cement, all that sort of stuff, that, that plays a part, and also on labour costs, the breakdown can be given on that. Thank you. At this stage, you might like to address that series of questions first. Okay, well, the, cost. The, the cost issue first, then, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's as just, particularly in relation to site costs, it's difficult because a site in one area obviously can be more, more expensive than another. Uh, but you raise a very valid point. Um, in terms of the hard cost, um, the hard cost Again, it depends on specifications of houses, etc. But it's under 50% of the overall cost of the provision of a unit. Um, and you're 100% correct. The, the pressure, and this is why we're advocating for a Minister for Construction to look at the overall um, output of the industry and likely demands. Because if we double our housing output, which is what's required, there is going to be supply and demand pressure. There is, is currently, we published a tender index recently for 2015, uh, tender price inflation was 5.5% in the year on construction. So if we double our housing output and private sector investment is increasing, there will be upward pressure on, on, on prices. So you're correct on that. Um, in relation to, just to, 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 because you asked this specifically earlier, and just to, to have, of the 50% that's the hard cost, what percentage of that, of the 50%, so 300,000 property, 150 is the hard cost, what's the breakdown there between materials and labour, which was a specific point you were trying to get at earlier? We, we, we're issuing a report next week. Now, we haven't gone down to the level of, of materials and labour. We've taken, uh, you may have missed, we, we've taken a study of, of about 10 different housing projects across the Greater Dublin area in 2016, some that are just finished and some that are on site. So, and we've taken an av and what the average hard cost of building that is. We haven't broken it down into labour and materials. We've broken it down into things like the foundations cost so much, the walls cost so much. But it's possible to do down to that level of detail. And I, I share your frustration because I'm frustrated. Yeah. We're talking about building a house. Yeah. 
And we're not able to find out what the labour cost in building the house is as a committee. We've asked, this is the second floor group we've we, asked, and it is somewhat yeah. frustrating because at the same time, the next step you're saying is there's, a, there's a inflation coming. And the inflation of 5% or what the, on the, the contract rate w was quite high. And we're trying to understand what's going on. And yet we don't know how much is the, the wage element of it. And, and I, I, frankly, I'm a little bit surprised that we don't know that because we would have thought that was a significant... Yeah, yeah. Sorry, just yeah. add to, to my, my colleague Michal, I suppose. Um, getting that granular, and, and just so, so we're clear on it, the, the issue is it's, it's not like... Unfortunately, it's not like the production of a motor car where you say this piece costs this and there's a, someone on the production line. What has happened, particularly in, in the downturn, is that people, uh, and we're not builders, but to give you a sense of how they go about it, if they go to build a house, they will say, well, I want someone to put in the, the, uh, the lights, I want someone to put in the, the skirting boards and, and, and the doors, and I want someone to lay the blocks. You will do a deal with someone, you don't care their cost of labour, but you'll say, I want a fixed price for that. So I suppose the reflection in what my colleague and, and his colleagues have, are putting together is the, what are the rates for substructure? What are the rates for structure? Within that, there has to be an inbuilt cost, but perhaps of, for labour. But the cost for labour may not reflect the true cost because someone uh, in the last five or six years was just buying turnover, for, for want of a better term. Um, so there's a piece, and, and maybe it's for the construction industry guys directly, the, the builders as such, to, to, to give you more on that. But there's a piece as to what is the labour cost w within that. But the reality is, the more than anyone building anything, you try and fix a price with someone for it. And the sense would be over the last few years that we're pricing below margin. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not, notwithstanding that, I mean, it, the, the industry has developed that way. It, it, people, builders don't seem to carry their own labour. There's a lot of subcontracting and outsourcing. Notwithstanding that, the society would be able to break down approximately. We, wouldn't, we don't have that today. We could break down approximately the labour and material content of the building of a house. Yeah, that that, that could be done, and we can forward that to the, to the yeah. committee. It'd be, it'd, you know, as, as Michael says, Every house has different specifications, but we can give you broadly what the, the labour and material percentages are of, of a unit, sir. Thank, thank yeah. you. Uh, the other question, sorry for interrupting there. The other questions that the uh, colleagues... Was it a question about supply particular to the Docklands area? Um, uh, and uh, I can't profess to have been involved in the original SDZ or the most recent one and the negotiations around housing supply there. Um, however, my own observations from anything that I am involved with down there is that, uh, and I think it's been alluded to, there, there is a requirement, uh, not only probably from uh, immediate local residents, but um, from an, a lot of people who are coming into that area, who are working in those various industries, and it is a real concern, I suppose, the society would have overall, uh, that Ireland Inc. is not uh, being serviced well by the fact that we're not producing enough uh, apartments, uh, in, particularly in that location. Um, uh, I would say that probably, um, uh, and, and again I can't be specific about what, um, uh, individual local needs, but one of the biggest impediments uh, so far has been uh, in the last five or six years in terms of that location has been the finance costs and the uncertainty around the, not even the selling price, but, but the, the rental stream in that um, uh, security of tenure long term should be f to the benefit of the tenant and should be a certainty of, for, for the landlord. And I suppose in Ireland we're only coming to terms with professional landlordism in that respect in, in a real way in the last five or six years since we've had um, a number of funds who've, who've bought and invested in Ireland. But to answer that in, in a nutshell, um, our view will be there should be greater densities, first of all in, in brownfield sites because we have to build up, there's no way we can build out uh, and we can leave the infrastructure there. Uh, and two, um, we, we, are, we do believe that the mechanism for delivery of, of the affordable element of the housing, so not the commercial end but the affordable element, should be more directed towards social housing entities who should be provided uh, the means to, to, to deliver on that because they have the, and this might address a, a query from someone else in terms of the delivery and how you fund the delivery of supply in that um, one of the biggest impediments to, to large uh, um, housing authorities that are um, uh, not, for, not for profit uh, housing authorities so far has been their capacity to leverage and, and borrow money at, at low level rates to, to develop housing on, on a real scale um, and I think that, that that deals with a technical issue regarding off balance sheet and balance sheet um, um, from, the, from the European um, uh, EIS in terms of its study on the stats on that but in a nutshell if local authorities uh, 
uh, probably shouldn't be the provider. The provider should be um, uh, housing associations who have the skill sets and they should be supported. And the construction costs for those will be tendered on the open market and that might address in general terms some of the issues if if the land comes at a very low cost to a social housing entity they can build it for whatever the market rates are by the tendering process and if they have the skill sets and the people within their organization to do that that's how you get transparency and um, uh, I, I hope that answers somewhat the question on that um, uh, I'll take the one maybe on the planning process. It's a, just a, a succinct response, really. We believe there should be an independent review of the operations of the planning uh, process. Uh, we believe that there should be some sort of incentivised structure put within the uh, process whereby those seeking planning uh, are incentivised to produce the, the right information as determined uh, uh, by the review of the process and also a responsibility and an accountability by the authority to work within within that process. So it's a two-way street, uh, you know, that, that, that it w should work. Uh, and then uh, resourcing and systems that are appropriate. I think the authority has been there for a long period of time uh, and I think that any review would probably... S s uh, turn up a need for resourcing uh, and that doesn't always mean more people but maybe more skilled people and and the systems uh, as as required um I pass to me or would you like to take the alternative social housing um, well, no from a quantity spraying perspective we didn't deal with the cost of um public sector housing and uh, without giving our report away in advance, but you know, you private sector housing, say a 1,200, 1200 square foot unit or of that order uh, is costing well in excess of 300k in the private sector, but we've also looked at the public sector and within the greater Dublin area it would appear that the equivalent cost is of the order of 230 to 260 because you don't have certain elements that the private sector have to, uh, to uh, cost. So just it's information that perhaps is useful to yourselves. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Ryan. Just a very quick one, Chairman. In terms of your proposals, you've uh, put in a comment in relation to NAMA ability with, with a question mark. And I'm just wondering, do you have some proposals behind that or is it just a suggestion for us, for us to think about? De I'll, I'll take, if you don't mind, I'll take uh, one or two more. Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, well, just on the, that you're currently undertaking a house construction cost study, you know, which has obviously dogged everyone here. Um, in the Irish Independent today, it has this €300,000 starter house that everyone is talking about, would actually cost 130000 Now, Mr Parlin said in the previous session, 150000 So it's just that. But we need to know on this committee, what is the component cost of a house? What, what's the land cost, what's the profit cost, what's the labour cost, the finance cost, the development levies cost. It needs to be broken down and, and hopefully your report, I just have another, I'll just finish these ones. The other one is this reduction in VAT that you're calling for and the CIF called for as well. Um, the, the, the problem with, if you cut taxes to get builders to build, there's a social cost to that. You know, it's less money for local authorities, less money for the public service, you know, less money for social housing. So, um, I, I mean, I, I would be completely opposed to it based on the cuts that have already been um, given in development levies as well, which you also agree with cutting. Um, just on streamlining the planning process, right, obviously this is something we do need emergency legislation to speed up building. Um, but if, if you mean things like, which you indicate, that local authorities shouldn't be able to say, put in their own you know, safeguards with regard to uh, development, there's already been cuts that Minister Kelly brought in the previous regime to reduce the size of apartments, for example. You know, and um, I think it's very dangerous to do stuff like that because in a few years' time, People won't be able to live in these apartments, you know, when they when they have uh, children and so on. And then, lastly, it just seems to be an array of the kind of incentives and uh, tax cuts for builders and developers that you're you're backing up. That, in in my view, hasn't served the country well in the past. Um, so, 
again, you just seem to be very similar to what the CIF was saying earlier on. Um, and uh, doesn't seem to be anything new calling for more cuts for developers, you know. Is there any, I'll come to you in one moment, is there anybody else at this stage who wants to, everybody happy? Just one final question, and you can address it with it. Uh, in your own proposals to improve supply and sustainability, you mention uh, to review central bank macro prudential levels. Now, normally when somebody asks for a review, they have something specific in mind. They have their own thoughts, so you might elaborate, what are you thinking of there? You don't ask for a review with nothing in mind, so there is... You might spell that out in your, in your own time. That one we can deal with very quickly. I think um, the, the members are of the view that we should ex the, the, the review should be accelerated because it leaves uncertainty in the marketplace. And whilst uh, it is understood that the bank have decided that they're going to review, it, 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 you know, the sooner that's done and the sooner that's clear to the market, then it offers some certainty. Um, okay. Sorry, and if I can just start by addressing a, a general questions over here on... Um, the similarity or in, possibly inferred between um, what we as society are saying and maybe what the, the, the house builders are saying. Um, I suppose to be clear, in terms of a planning and, and uh, the f uh, streamlining and making the planning system more efficient, we're not talking about a reduction, uh, if it's come across that way, it shouldn't. We're not talking about a reduction in, in the quality and the structures around the planning system. We're merely talking about a more efficient way of doing it in terms of not getting into too much granular detail, but ultimately at the moment there are local area plans, there are regional planning guidelines, Lines, and then you have a, um, the, the county development plans and it builds it up to, uh, to, to a tier which is, is, is all merited. However, we're saying maybe it's more efficient to use a lot of that time to, put, to create strategic development zones where a majority of the issues that will be dealt with in a detailed planning application can be dealt with up front where, and it's just a more efficient use of resources. We're not advocating a reduction in standards where, where it's commercially appropriate at, at, at all. That's an, uh, and uh, just to be clear on that, as a profession, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not constructing the houses. We are involved in overseeing a variety of, 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 of the services that, that evolve with that. So we, we do not uh, support in any way anything that, that, that would uh, reduce the quality of what's going to be delivered. Um, I, I don't know, uh, Michal, if you want to... In relation to the, to the cost, and, and in particular Deputy Coppinger, um, uh, the, the, we are entirely independent, I think, is, uh, of the, the house builders. If you break down the cost of building a unit, your hard cost is pretty much fixed. You find our study will show that the cost of building, actually building the unit, there's not a great range of that. So it leaves you with certain other items that you can review, VAT being one of them. Now, we, we've, we've stated in, in, in seminars previously that the, there is a concern, and we share the concern, would developers be pocketing this 3% of a proposed reduction? But if we go back to the bigger picture, well, well you see, we, you know, we're trying to provide independent, independent uh, analysis here. We, 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 um, if you go back to the scenario we painted at the very outset, the central bank has put a, a roof up here on, the, on what people can borrow that house for, and currently your costs are here. So your hard costs are fixed, and they're only going to go one way because of supply and demand, labour costs, material costs are going to increase. So it leaves you with very few elements of the cost of providing the unit that you can address. Uh, finance being one, VAT being another, and land costs, they're the key ones. The, the, things like levies, professional fees, they are relatively small in the overall context. So we're not, we, we are very aware of the, the social impact of the 3% reduction on, uh, on the exchequer and the follow-on services, but this is an emergency, so we're putting it out there. And we can show you the what-ifs. It's up to you guys to decide what you want to do. We can only show you the what-ifs in an independent manner. Um, so, uh, sorry, Patricia. Chair, yeah. I think we, what we said in relation to the VAT also is that it might be uh, uh, on a trial basis for two to three years to just deal with this emergency situation. We're not at all um, interested in de denuding the exchequer from valuable income, and we're very conscious of that. And we would, as Michal said, like to emphasise we're a professional, independent body here, uh, and we, we, we would see ourselves in totally different space uh, to the developers or the construction industry. Absolutely. It goes back to the point we were making. If we had an overarching minister that could review the effectiveness of these measures, they can be changed. I mean, you, have the, you had it in the hospitality, hospitality sector where it was reduced to 9%. Some people might have made more from that than other hotels, but that's the nature. It has to be reviewed constantly. Now, I understand the point you're making, that if the rate comes down and the quantity goes up, the total yield might go up. I, yes. I, yes. I, I, I get that point. Anyone else?
Sorry. Briefly, just um, the welcome comments that you've made at the start, and I think I was struck by the, the, the term you used, the system was broken. You know, and in your, in, your, in your presentation as well, you also say the current crisis is a direct consequence of national strategy, and you also say that over-reliance on private sector to provide all housing is obviously a huge problem. The, the, the plan we have at the moment, the Minister's plan, the 2020 plan to deliver 100,000 houses, is based on 80% of that being delivered by the private. So I think that's something that needs to be flagged up. So that's obviously going to be a problem that we're, we're fla or you're flagging yourselves, and it's good to see it put down in, in, in documentation. Also, just if you could expand on what you, you talk about local authority investment in infrastructure, maybe expand on what you mean, what, what they need to do, and what funding they need to get to do that. Um, in terms of local authority uh, and, and infrastructure, um, uh, in, in many cases, in general terms, this land is zoned, but it's not serviced. Um, and in that regard, there are impediments there uh, to, to get that servicing in place. Um, and uh, it's, it's to uh, facilitate that delivery of infrastructure to, uh, to, to allow that to happen. Um, one of the other scenarios that sometimes, uh, I suppose, in terms of uh, um, facilitating development, uh, it, it's never one solution, it's a variety of solutions. One of the other solutions that has been proposed by our members and has been used, I think, in, in the 1960s and early 70s, was where uh, local authorities in some respects might provide the infrastructure to individual sites uh, and then areas of sites on a large scale are licensed out to smaller builders who would build a, a certain section of housing units. So therefore you have a diversity in terms of the supply, you have a competition in terms of, of, of deliverability, So and yet you also have a, that there's not over reliance on one or two key large players. And that was used to, to a certain extent in, in those periods of time and it worked quite well. I presume anyone in the room can bring examples of where the, it didn't work well, but in the majority of cases it did, and we would see that's maybe an area where local authority could play a role in the provision of, of infrastructure. Yeah, okay. Everybody happy? Okay, just before we conclude, um, specifically, you mentioned uh, the report next week, and I'd be very obliged if you could forward it to the committee. Uh, the issue, just so you're, you're aware, from previous meetings, the issue of the cost of housing has been a significant and the component elements and I suppose one of the concerns we would have as a committee isn't just the cost now but you indicated that the tenders and contract prices are going up and up yet we had previous people present to this committee who said that you know if you're building a bigger scale that there would be economies of scale and so forth in terms of materials and whatever so some of that we we wouldn't like to take it as a given that coming from a low a relatively low construction base the prices should go up way ahead of the rate of inflation and I think that's why we're trying to get what is the labour component and I, I, I suppose segregating the labour component from the material component I understand about de development levies I de understand about the VAT and all of that but we're looking at each section in the total so in terms of your response your written response with the committee that's what we're trying to get behind not to take that uh, construction inflation is a given at five percent or anything like that that would be very worrying if that were to be the case and that's why we're trying to get the breakdown of the various components um sorry yes, yes uh, i i, I think that Fire. we we rec recognized as as a committee recognized um that you know getting to the real facts and breaking down to the to the real cost was what was missing uh we were able to as we are able to poll our members um at at a very quick within quick timelines to talk about real costs and I would say that uh, in this instance we will come back to you with with uh, the information but we're very happy to work with you uh, on an ongoing basis because we serve our members on a regular basis and you know where other reports take six months to a year we don't have that time lag uh, we are an independent professional body we give it and say it as it is so uh, we, we intend to continue under our own um, I suppose strategic uh, uh, objective to uh, I suppose influence policy in an independent manner so if we can do anything on that front on an, on an ongoing basis we'll do that for you as well I appreciate that and that and specifically to Michal who indicated that the information he's sending us is from 2016 projects so yeah, it's yeah. right up to date and we do appreciate that so I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Michal Mahan, Ms. Patricia Byron and Mr. Michael Cleary for your attendance today and your submission uh, which you can see provoked a number of questions and your focus with your answers uh, I now suspend the meeting until 2pm this afternoon thank you, thank you.